Thank you, everyone, for joining us for another one of the Siemens Cinemaric online seminars. Today, we're going to get a chance to explore the world of post processors. I am. Uh, we're going to kind of delve into all of the syntax and functionality that you want to be seeing coming out of your post processor. That really is going to allow the Cinemaric control to to really achieve its um, its true potential. Um, generally speaking. We tend to run into some roadblocks when we come to, you know, dealing with posted code, uh, code, you know, code that's coming out of a CAD/CAM system if the post hasn't been handled properly. So that's really what we're going to talk about today. So with that being said, I am going to be your host and your presenter, Chris Pollock. I am what we call the Virtual TAC Manager, or the VTAC Manager. So it's a very fancy title, but basically at the end of the day, I do a lot of the web-based content for Siemens specific to topics of operation and programming. So if you guys need me, need to reach out, um, have any questions within that arena, or just need some assistance navigating through Siemens, I am a, I'm a resource here for you. Um, certainly you can always email me or call me if you get into a bind. Email is usually the best, best way to get a hold of me. But I am available. Uh, to guide and assist you guys. And again, I specialize more from the operational programming perspective, but if you guys are having service or technical issues, I can usually drive you in the right direction. So before we begin, let's uh, talk about what's coming up. This is a, uh, an annual uh, or a reoccurring seminar. Uh, we do it about every six weeks, so I always like to kind of plug what's coming up in the future. And the next one, coming in this July is going to be on adaptive control and monitoring, we refer to it as ACM. So adaptive control is also referred in the industry to adaptive feed, so where we can dynamically change our feed rate based on load conditions, um, all sorts of different occurrences. So historically, uh, we didn't have a standard Siemens product for the ACM portfolio. We left it out to third-party companies that would apply kind of their flavor, but we've recently purchased a company called Modov that has been a partner with us for quite some time, and we're bringing basically their solution, and we're, we're bringing it into the Siemens portfolio as our solution. So you're going to get a chance to see um, that functionality. Uh, we're going to have a guest presenter that's going to come in. It's going to show it to us, so it should be really, uh, really interesting. I would say if you guys have some time, by all means, check it out. You'll get an email blast uh, reminding you when it's going to be. Now, any and all of the webinar content we do is certainly available for your reference on our main website, which is the CNC for You website that we have posted up here in front of you. So any of this stuff, as well as a whole host of different material that's available to you, can be found on CNC for You. If you want to go right to the webinars and see the library of past webinars, so all these webinars that we do are these online seminars that get recorded, and then the recording goes into a library. So to date, we're well over 50 of these recorded seminars of all sorts of different content. So if you're looking for information specifically on the, um, on the Siemens portfolio, I would say, you know, check out the webinars. Um, I am getting one attendee saying he's having trouble with the audio. Uh, guys, can you just type into the chat window if you're hearing me properly? see. Yep, okay, everybody else sounds good, so I think it's this gentleman's problem. Give me one second. Oh, bear with me. Okay, a few people are having a problem today. That's interesting. Uh, just give me one second. This is always the fun about managing these things all on your own. Um, okay, but it looks like everybody else has got the feed, so we will continue on. 
So as I mentioned, uh, this is just a great resource for you guys. So as we build more material, just keep checking out over here. A lot of this stuff is also found on our Mr. CNC YouTube channel. So I would say, you know, check out either of them. All right. Now, additionally, um, in parallel to all of our online-based contents, we also do in-person training seminars. So if you guys are interested in coming in and attending an in-person class with us, they're available here. You can see a list of upcoming classes. And what we're starting to do now as well is we're going to start to do some specialty classes. So this summer I am going to be um, I'm going to be presenting a advanced variable programming class. So that'll be an invitation only class. You won't see it on this main site, um, but anybody of you that are in our contact library, if um, as long as you're there, you're going to get sent out a uh, you're going to get, you're going to get sent out. A, a reminder or an invitation, and you guys can then register and come in. Um, either way, whether you use that link or you use the link on this website, you can then register for these classes. Okay. Now, the topic we're going to talk about today is specifically referring to two base controls, the Cinemark 828 and the Cinemark 840 control. So all of the functionality we talk about would apply to either of these two controls. Um, additionally to that, we do have an 808 control in our portfolio. That control um, is a little bit different. So I would say a lot of the functionality we're going to look today will be a direct drop-in for the 808, but not all of it. But certainly if you guys are looking to develop posts for the 828 or the 840 on our current platform, this content would apply to that scenario. So before we get started, I do want to talk about what is a post processor first, because this tends to be a little bit of confusion in the industry. You know, I, I hear a lot of end users, they are asking the, either the control manufacturer or the machine tool OEM to provide the post processor for the machine. So what a post processor really is, is it's, it's just a translator. So the CAD CAM systems out there, you know, they have all this core data, usually referred to as CLL, CL data, that is describing what some tool path is going to look like. And the CAM system had to have a way of then taking their code, right, their internally stored data, and translating it in a method to where they can build a part program that will be run by a specific machine tool, or more importantly, a specific control. And that is done by the post processor. So because of that, because it's, a, it's the nature of translating something specific to the CAM system, the post processor is actually held and owned by the CAD CAM system. So it's developed internally in their own software, and then it is that primary tool that allows them to translate their code into an external program that can be read by a machine tool, and specifically a machine tool control. So when you, when you kind of ask the, the control manufacturer or the OEM to provide the post, it gets very difficult because obviously every, system, every CAM system out there has their own unique programming language, own unique post processors. So the post really has to be developed in conjunction with the CAM system because it's really running internally in their system. So what really kind of sets us all up for the best success here is if we can have a, a good um, relationship between the CAD CAM manufacturer, the CNC control manufacturer, and even the machine tool manufacturer. And this way, if we all talk to each other, we can kind of get all on the same page. It's also why I do a lot of you know seminars on these types of topics, because we're truly trying to leave that, that, that pain point. And let's face it, the post processor, that is that, that critical piece of the puzzle that if you do not have a good post processor functioning, then it doesn't matter how great your CAD CAM system is or how great the machine is, you're not going to get part, good part production. So it's critical that we're really applying the proper syntax, the proper structure, the proper format when developing these post processors and in turn creating the output G code. So that's really what a post processor is. It's really just a translator. It's that piece of trans piece of software that sits between the CAM system and what eventually will be a part program that's going to be residing in the machine tool. Now, 
Before we go much further, I do want to reference some specific content or documentation that you can use to support all, really all of the material that I'm going to be showing you uh, over the course of the next hour or so. And really the first one I would, I would look at is what we refer to as our Fundamentals Programming Manual. So if you go to this website, this supportindustry.themis.com, this has a wealth of knowledge within the Cinema Control. So I would say get to the landing page and then do a search for Fundamentals Programming Manual. That's going to bring up a few different options there. I think quickly you, you'll, you'll find the manual section. And then there, it's a PDF. You can be open it, or more importantly, you could save it locally. So the fundamentals, that's really going to go through a lot of the preliminary functionality that we talked about. Basic structure, header commands, tool protocols, tool, com tool commands. The next step is when we get into some of the more advanced content, like getting into cycles, is referencing what we call our job planning manual. So same website, go in there and take a look for the programming manual referred to as job planning. And that manual, that's going to start to get into a lot of the higher level functionality. And really probably one of the most important pieces inside that manual is what we refer to as the programming cycles externally chapter. And this is that chapter that's going to really break down our CAN cycles and show you from a post-development standpoint what each variable within the CAN cycle is referring to so then you know how to plug it in to the native code that you have in your CAM system. So that's where you can really start to find all of the higher level content is in this job planning manual. I would say probably 95% of everything we're going to go through in these next slides came out of one of these two manuals, or at least referenced in one of these two manuals. It might even be even higher than that. So do yourself a favor, check out the website, get these. If you have any trouble finding the manuals, shoot me an email, and I can certainly get you the direct links to those manuals. Okay. Now, before we move much further, the next step would be, how do I kind of prove out my code? You know, that's always a challenge. You know, we're going to start plugging in variables, start outputting code out of our CAM system, and we're going to want to be able to validate it. So one of the tools that we have for you is what we refer to as a digital twin. But sometimes it gets a little confusing in the industry. What, what do we mean by digital twin? So there's, there's two potential pieces of software that we produce here at Siemens that actually are creating a digital twin. The first and the piece of software we're going to use in this, this seminar is what's called SinuTrain. And SinuTrain is what you're seeing represented on the left, but basically it's a piece of software that's going to emulate a CNC control, but riding right inside your PC. And from a post-development standpoint, it's a, it's a fabulous tool because it allows you to actually drop your posted program into a machine and run it without actually having to get to a real machine tool. So you can validate syntaxes, um, just basic structure, and actually see the machine moving around. Now, in parallel to that, we have another piece of software we refer to as VNCK Virtual Machine. And VNCK also stands for Virtual NC Kernel. And that is a tool that we can actually lease out or, 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 or sell out to outside companies, and they can actually have our kernel, what truly makes our CNC do what it's going to do, running inside of their own simulation engine. So what you see on the right, that is the virtual kernel running inside of NX. Um, we also work with um, some of the external simulation packages and license VNCK to them. Um, certainly, um, really any CAN-CAM system could incorporate it if they wanted to. So that is a little bit more when I'm going to get to the point of an end user where I want to see fixturing, clamping. I want to be able to have an entire virtual world that would be my VNCK side of the digital twin. But for our purposes, SinuTrain is really what's going to allow you guys to have access to a machine tool really at, the, at your fingertips. So at any point in time when you are, when you're proving out your code. So what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you where you can go to get SinuTrain and how to use it just enough so you guys can start to prove out your own code and kind of work this stuff out. So 
first things first, Cine Train is a package that's supporting all of our standard uh, Windows versions out there to date. So if you're running Windows 7, Windows 8.1, or Windows 10, you'll be able to use um, this software. Here's a, a direct link to it, the Siemens.de forward slash Cine Train downloads. That'll drive you to the website. Or you can actually go right to our global CNCPU website, and that's going to be the website we have right on the top of the screen. So this is going to be the, the location you're going to want to go to to be able to download CineTrain. And what happens here is there's actually a demo version that you can use that we're going to use in this course that you don't have to purchase. It's completely free. Now, it is a little limited on technology, but if you're proving out basic code, basic post structure, it's really going to be more than, more than adequate for you to start to you know, verify your code and check your tool path without having to worry about getting programs right to the machine tool right on the floor. So when you go over to the Siemens.com forward slash CNC for you, there's a link right on the home page called CNU Train Downloads. And from there, you're going to get a secondary option to then choose which of the CNU Train versions you would want to download. So our current software release is the version 4.8. Really, you can pick either 4.8 or 4.7. From the part program perspective, they're basically identical. Um, we've done some back-end cycles in the 4.8 release, um, more content that's maybe specific to a machine tool OEM manufacturer. But from an operation programming scenario, 4.7 and 4.8 are, are pretty much identical pieces of software. So you can grab either one. It's really not going to hurt you either way, whichever one you get. So use the download link. Bring it down. Now, it is a pretty large piece of software. It's a couple gigabytes. So you want to do it at night or in the evening. Give it a chance to download. It's going to take a little while. But once you get it down, once you install it up, then what you'll now have the ability to do is actually build the machines from our built-in template. So we're going, to, we're going to show you how to do that in a second live. But what I wanted to show you specifically is from the template machines, there's two machines available for you that are completely functional. So there's the demo lathe, and then additionally you see here highlighted the demo milling machine. Now the demo lathe is a basic two axis lathe. The demo mill is a basic three axis milling machine. So if you're gonna to start to get into more complex um, types of machine tools, and you wanna be able to fully have the complete capability of a, let's say five axis machine or multi-channel machine, well, then it may pay to get the license of CineTrain, and that's going to completely open you up to be able to use any type of configuration machine. But prior to that, you can always use the demo mill and demo lathe, and what we allow you to do is in the demo mill and demo lathe, without a license, you can still move programs in and out. And that's really one of the limitations that you get if you don't have the full version. If I pick any of these other template machines, like for argument's sake, the vertical milling machine with swivel table, that's a full five-axis kinematic, but because you're running in a demo mode, we don't let you bring programs in and out. You would need to get the full license for that. But as long as you're using demo mill, I can start to bring these programs in and out. So you go to the template, and we're going to pick a machine, and then it's going to create basically what you see here in front of you, which is a, a tile on in your library of machine tools. Now, what's unique about CineTrain is you can move between all sorts of different kinematic type of machine tools and actually have them in your library. You know, from an end user perspective, you could have your entire shop floor of Cinemar controls represented here as separate machines. Once you get the full license, you can even go as far as have custom set files or machine files built from archives pulled out of your actual machine, and then you truly get a digital twin of the machine you have in your floor. But for our case, just build it with the demo mill. You're going to launch it by hitting the play button, and that's going to come in, and that's going to launch CineTrain for you. So let's go through that step real quick. We're not going to install the software per se, but what I do want to show you is the library. So when you first launch CineTrain and you install it, all these tiles you see here on mine, you obviously I deal with a lot of machine tools, so I have a lot of tiles. Um, but this is all going to be blank. There will be nothing here in the library. But what you will see on the left side is your Use Template. So you want to just select Use Template, and then you're going to do a pull down. Now, I happen to have multiple versions installed, so you'll see the different versions of software. But if you just have one version, you'll just see the version number that you installed. And then you'll see the available machines part of our template, bolt, you know, template library. 
So by simply selecting Demo Mill, you can give it a unique name. You can change the screen resolution. Now this isn't your desktop monitor, but this is the size that the screen representing the machine tool screen is going to look like. So you're always going to use a smaller resolution than your actual PC. So you pick a res that you want, you can put notes in here, and you can make as many of these machines as you want. From there you hit create, and once you hit create, it's going to build the physical machine. So you're going to get a tile. Once you have the tile, it's a matter of just starting the machine. Now, if you chose maybe the wrong setting or you wanted to add notes, you can always right-click on the tile, go back to settings, and you can start to tweak any of this stuff. So I've already kind of pre-created mine a little bit, so I'm not going to build one from scratch, but I am going to launch up this machine. So once you hit play, it's going to boot up the machine, just as if you were booting up the real machine tool. What you see on the perimeter, this is all the machine control panel, overrides, enables. So there's a couple steps we're going to show you that you would have to do before you could start using the tool in developing your post processors. But we're going to let it boot up. Now, I was talking about that screen resolution. That is this display size. So if you chose one that's really small, go back and try a little larger setting. If you chose one too big, you'll see that it's going to push the machine control panel off of your screen. And then you got to scroll up and down. So usually I like to get one that's just going to fit the display just enough where I can have full usable space on my screen, get to all of my buttons without having to grab any bars and pull up or pull down. Now, when you start to use SinewTrain, there's a couple things you're going to have to get used to doing. And this is something you're going to do every time. So when you first power up SinewTrain, the system is going to be showing you your coordinate display based on your machine zero. Now, generally speaking, you're probably going to want to be displaying the work coordinate system. So there's an actual values machine that we're going to select. So once you hit that, just hit it once, and then it'll maintain that for however long you're in that machine. But when you do shut off Cine Train and reload the machine, you are going to have to reselect this button again. So just keep that in mind. Additionally, I'm going to have to turn on my overrides and my spindle and feed enable commands. And this I'm going to want to do because at some point I'm probably going to want to start to run part programs. And if I forget to do this, then nothing's going to move. So every time you power it up, you're going to have to give some overrides and you're going to have to give your enables. Now, you don't have to choose your unit of measure every single time. It's going to remember the state you left it in last, but you may need to change unit of measure. By default, when you build a machine, it's going to come in, and it's going to come in a metric mode. So if I want to change the unit of measure, I just expand my horizontal keys over, and I get to a button called Settings. And then inside of Settings, I'm going to use the Change Over Metric. Now, everything I'm doing right now is in the Jog screen. So that is the screen that we first saw when we powered up. So when I first powered this machine up, I haven't done anything. You see in the upper right-hand corner, I'm sitting in Jog, and I see the actual value machine button is highlighted. So just select that one, and it'll put you to the work coordinate system. Now you can give it some enables. It's a matter of just grabbing your overrides and cranking them up. doesn't really matter where you put them, just to something. And turn on your two enable buttons. Now you see in mine, I've already switched the machine over to inch mode. But if you just built one, you'd be at metric. So if you expand the horizontal soft keys with this, this gray arrow button, see how it changes your soft keys? you can see the setting button. And settings gives us the change over to metric or change over to inch button. It's a matter of just hitting it, saying, okay, it's gonna change the unit of measure. And that switches the whole control. So offset tables, if I built different tools, it actually updates all of my offsets based on the unit of measure I chose. You know, so I don't jump it back, now we see inch values. So generally speaking, you know, you're probably gonna be developing a post for one type of unit of measure or another. So once you switch this, then you're going to leave it alone. But you do have to remember to expand those keys over if you're looking for the setting buttons to make that, sh that switch. So from here, really, there's, there's not a whole lot extra you're going to have to learn about SinuTrain other than just you know, basic navigation. So just keep that in mind when you power it up. Actual values machine, give it your enables. Hit your enable buttons, give it some overrides, and you should be ready to start running this SinuTrain software. Now, the next step in SinuTrain is moving programs in and out. So I mentioned that the demo mill is fully functional. But by default, 
we don't give you any mapped directories or mapped folders. And you're going to want to be able to post your files to a specific folder. And then from there, grab them and use them inside of Sinutrain. So this is the process that you can actually create your own map directories. Now, you will be able to have a USB stick right out of the box. But last thing you want to have to be doing is posting files to a USB stick to then move them into Sinutrain. So what we're going to show you how to do is create your own custom button. So when we're in Sinutrain, if we hit the menu select button, it's a hard key up just above our arrow keys, we get the option for setup. Setup is a horizontal soft key. Now inside of setup, you're going to see there's a button called HMI. Now under HMI, there's an additional button called logical drives. And what logical drives will let me do is now adjust the soft keys that are available inside what we call program manager. So if I was to use this hard key initially, this program manager button, this would show me where all my part programs are. Now for you guys, when you first set it up, you would not have this program button. I created this, and this is what we're showing you how to do. So you'd have internal folders where you could keep your part programs, but nothing that allows you to see outside of this CineTrain machine. Again, you can use a USB stick, but who wants to have to keep copying stuff to a USB stick? So when we go menu select and setup and go into HMI and pick that logical drive, just like I was showing you, I can now pick an available button. So in your case, you probably want to start with five. I'm going to build you a new button just so you can see it. I can pick six. And now I hit the vertical soft key for change. And I can pull down and select the type of directory I want to create. Now, all these other directory types, that would be more specific if I was actually mapping directories on a machine tool. For us in CineTrain, you're only concerned with this Windows Drive PCU. So I select that. And now I just really have to give the system a basic path. And the path would be whatever folder I want to be able to save to. So bring up Windows Explorer. I'm just going to slide it over here so you guys can see it and just navigate to a specific directory. So let's say I knew all of my programs were going to be under my programming examples folder. So once you've browsed to the folder that you want to get the path from, if you click just to the right of the shortcut bar, it'll actually reformat that to be the true DOS path. And this is what I need. So in my case, it's under my D drive is where my programming examples folder is. So now it's as simple as just copying and pasting that path right here into the path of the machine. Now, if you knew your path, you could have hand typed it out for sure. Um, but how many of us are going to remember all those different paths for different folders? So just browse over to it, grab the path. Now, the last thing I might want to do is give it some kind of saw, some kind of text for my button. So you know, maybe I'm going to call mine samples. So I just come down to the soft key text area. And then you see it even updates the button for me. And the last thing I got to do is hit OK. So once I hit OK, it's now going to build that folder. And if that folder didn't exist, it would error out and tell me there's a problem, probably because I copied and pasted it wrong. So from there, I can then double check it. But in our case, it came out OK. So if I go back to Program Manager to see all my part program area, now I have a samples folder. So I have the root of that folder, Programs. And then now I even have a Samples folder that's going to put me under Programming Examples as a shortcut. And you can do these shortcuts for really as many free buttons are here. So we can actually toggle over to multiple levels. So there's a ton of buttons there available for you. I would say you're probably only going to need one or two folders. So that is the process step. So keep that in mind when I'm working with CineTrain. I do want to be able to map to that directory. So once I've done that, now I really have a sinew train I can start doing something with. So about the only thing that might be left for me would be creating or building tools. So when I go to run a part program, I'm going to have to build some, some basic tools. So we'll, we'll talk about that as we get into some programming examples and show you just the, the very basics of building tools. You don't have to get very complex here. Um, let's face it, what kind of tools are we going to build? We're going to build an end mill. We're going to build a drill. You know, Just when we're working out posts, we don't need to have any, any complicated tooling. But we'll start to talk about that. So that's about the only extra step you're going to have to really learn. And then the rest of it is just kind of getting used to using it. 
So once you have Senior Train set up and you're ready to start writing a post, then this is where we start to get into obviously the meat of this seminar. So what do I have to know about building a post? Well, we're going to kind of build this in steps, kind of how I would write the program. So the first thing I would need to create would be a program name. So here are the rules for you when building a program name within the Siemens control. First and foremost, programs are going to have either .mpf or .spf extension. So MPF, main program file, or SPF stands for subprogram file. Now these are all standard TESX formats, so they could be opened in, opened in WordPad or Notepad. We just don't happen to use a .txt extension, we use MPF for our own internal, our own internal uh, extension. But again, it's simply a text file, but give it that .mpf. So traditionally speaking, I would say most post processors are only going to ever build a .mpf file. If you do have a post that's building main and subs automatically and you want to follow that, that subroutine formatting, then you can use your .spfs. Now, main program files and subprogram files, these are going to be all G-code programs. Um, it's possible, if you were programming at the control, that the conversational format of the control would also use an MPF extension. But from external programming, you're only going to program G-code, and that's always going to be in the .mpf or SPS format. Now, once you've Go to build the file, maximum 24 characters, and we support specifically letters, numbers, and underscores. Other than that, we don't want to see dashes, percent signs, forward slashes, any kind of special characters. Uh, don't even want to see spaces. So you always want to use a letter, number, or an underscore. Now, if from a posting standpoint, you build with some other character, because let's face it, Windows will let you name a file just about anything, Generally speaking, what will happen is when you go to copy the program into memory, we will catch it and tell you there's some kind of unrecognized character, and then you're going to have to edit the file at that point. So if you can just get in the habit, or better yet, if there's some way you can build some rules into your post processor that keeps a user from doing anything other than these three uh, character types, that would be the best case scenario. Now, when you go to create a program name, a lot of guys don't realize this because the control can be pretty forgiving. But technically speaking, the first two letters of any program name should either be letters or an underscore in a letter. We should never start a program with two numerical values in the beginning of the program. Now, a lot of guys will push back on me and say, I build part programs with numerical values all the time. I never have a problem. And you know, they, I do it too. If I'm cheating real quick, I can just type in a program number and I can continue on. But the reason why we tell you to, to never use the first two characters as a number is when you get to doing um, program calls. So if I'm calling one file up from another file, the minute we have two numerical values in the beginning of the program, it, we don't necessarily recognize that as potentially an external program. So you always want to follow this rule. So two letters or an underscore and a letter to start, 24 characters, and only letters, numbers, and underscores. That's going to get us started with creating a part program. Then from there, we're then going to build our safety block, right, or our program header. So this is a pretty common structure. You know, nothing too fancy here. You're going to start to see a lot of this stuff is very familiar to what you're probably used to from the ISO side of the world. So this would be kind of how I would start seeing it build. Now, you don't have to have block numbers or sequence numbers. Uh, but yeah, they're a good thing to have in the part program, especially when you get into like alarms or, or error messages, because it'll point you to the line, but you know it, it might be a little misleading as to where it's pointing you as to what line if you don't have any line numbers. The minute you have an end number on a line, it's going to show up in the alarm message. It's going to point you right there. So end numbers are positive integers. So basically, no decimal places. No negative numbers, right? So you can start at one, you can go one, two, three, you can skip them. As far as the maximum size, it gets super large. I think I've done up to 11 or 12 places. Never had, a, never had an issue. So you can get really big, but you want to try to keep from redoing the same end number later in the program. Now, a lot of times you see CAD CAM systems will do that because you are limited as to the maximum number of, you know, size of the end number in a lot of controls. If you do it, it'll run, it'll work. So I can say, okay, I'm going to max out at, you know, 1,000 for my sequence numbers and then start over again. 
where it could run into a problem. So is if you do a mid-program restart and we're scanning to that point, now you're kind of asking, hey, there could be four or five N one thousands in the program. So if you can, you always keep the end numbers unique. Now, as far as the actual line, any given line, you can support up to 512 characters. So a line can get really big. Um, so don't worry about having to truncate all your data. Uh, if you need a line number of a million, let it, let it go out to a million. That's okay. Next step, probably going to want to tell the system if we're absolute or incremental. So in the Siemens control, G90 is going to be absolute. G91 is going to be incremental. And then we have our unit of measure. So we actually have four different commands for intermetric. G70 or 700 would refer to inch, and G71 or 710 would refer to metric. So it's our recommendation that you always use the three-digit code, or should I say four-digit, including the G, and that would be the G700 or the G710 to stipulate inch or metric. And the reason being is it has to do with how the control applies feed rate. So as long as you tell the system G700, then all units of measure, including all feed rates, will be interpreted in inch mode in that program. Vice versa, if you use G710, all units of measure, all feed rates are going to be interpreted as a metric value. So use the, the 700 or the 710 to switch between our unit of measure. But that would be similar to what a G20 or 21 in the standard ISO format. Then you're going to come in and you're going to set the work coordinate. And I always like to set the work coordinate right here in the first safety line. This way, there's no chance of me moving around the machine without it knowing the work coordinate system. So in the Siemens control, in the 840, we support G54 through 57. And then we jump up to G505 right up to 599. That's our full 99 available work offsets. In the G28, it's a little different flavor. You can actually do G54 through G59. So we actually support the 58 and 59 in the 828. And then we jump over 505 and 506 and start right at 507 to 599. So very similar. If you're trying to methodize a post that will work in either control and you don't necessarily know what control you have, I would say probably the simplest thing is just to skip over 58 and 59 and go from G57 right up to G507. And this way you won't potentially have an incompatibility between the two controls. And the last thing we're going to define is our default tool plane. We're going to talk about this a little more moving forward, but the default tool plane is going to stipulate the orientation of the tool and then later how we would apply our cutter comp. We don't use it for arc interpolation like a lot of controls do, but it is what tells us what plane our cutter compensation will be working in because it's always perpendicular to your tool orientation. So once you've set up your basic safety line, the next step is going to be getting into what we refer to as the workpiece blank. And the workpiece blank is the first cycle you're going to see within the Siemens control. And this is what sets up our simulation graphics. So you don't really need the workpiece blank, but if you want a user to be able to simulate at the control and see the full solid model and graphics, they're going to want to use the workpiece blank. So as you see here in front of you, we have five different primitives that we can support. I would say, generally speaking, the most common one to support, however, would be box, and that would be a basic rectangular shape where you define two opposing corners and then a top and a bottom, and then we have a basic primitive block. Um, if your system has the capability of doing cylinders uh, or maybe even pipes, certainly it's all available for you. If you reference the job planning manual, we will then go through all of the components that build up this blank. So in our system, we use what's called a common delimited string. So any cycle, they're just going to have a cycle name and then two parentheses and then a bunch of commas, right, and values in them. And this always throws guys off, especially from the post-processing standpoint, because we're used to IJKs. We're used to having some kind of definer telling us which variable we're pushing into. Well, the reason the Siemens control doesn't have that is because you have conversational masks built into the control when you're at the control. However, you as a CAD CAM post writer, you don't have that at your fingertips. So you're going to have to kind of decipher the cycle breakdown and then go into CineTrain and validate your calls by really opening up the cycle and see if everything appears to have fed in properly. So these are all the basic elements that would make up a cycle, in this case, building up our block. 
then from there, we can maybe go in and give some comments to the system. So anything that is started with a semicolon is going to be considered a comment in the control. So anything to the right of semicolon is not going to be executed by the machine's control. So I can have actual code, like you see on that first line where it says my G90, G700, and then I can, I can follow that up by a semicolon and add comments right on G code lines, or I can have my own discrete lines. Now additionally, beyond just being able to have comments inside of the part program, I might want to push out a comment to a user, and that's where I would use the message command. So the message command is as simple as giving it the instruction MSG, open, close parentheses, and then inside of it, whatever is inside the quotations is what gets pushed out to the user as a comment. So this is great for telling them maybe which operation he's in or some specific information about the tool that's loaded or whatnot. So anytime I want to have a message that's going to be up during the length of an operation, and it's not dependent on you know reading it through the G code, use the message command. Now with message, you're probably going to want to get to a point where you clear the message. So then the message, open close parentheses, is just a quick way of getting rid of whatever's displayed, because this is modal. So this is going to stay displayed until I either hit M30 or another, another message precedes it, or I do a clear. So let's kind of show you a little bit about how, oops, sorry, how I can start to build a part program. So I'm just going to jump out to my slide deck here because I want to just grab all this geometry. And I want to show you how the whole thing's going to work. So let's say we, um, we bring up maybe Notepad. You, know, you would be doing this, obviously, from the post-processor perspective. So you'd have the system paste out to some kind of editor, right, some basic program. So again, as I mentioned, just simple ASCII text format. I'm going to throw an M30 in here for me and probably get rid of these dots because that wouldn't mean anything. We'll just put maybe a program stop or something there. So this could be the start of my part program. So when I'm saving it, I'm just going to do a basic save and path it to wherever that shared folder was. So I had mine under uh, programming examples, under programs, and I'm just going to call mine. We'll say this is sample. And you notice I want to be careful about putting in my appropriate text with my extension. It's a text format, but it's using a, a .mpf. So if I save it, now I have this file that's just a text file with a dot, oops, I had a typo. I said MPG, <laughs> glad I caught that. All right, so I'm saving it with my .mpf main program file. I'm using letters numbers and underscores, but no spaces, no other spectral characters. Uppercase, lowercase, we don't really care about, so you can you can interchange them if you want. That's fine. And we're going to write that in. Oops. And what'd you do? There it goes. Okay. So if I switch over to Sinew Train and I go over to Program Manager, this is where I'm going to start to see all my program directories. So remember, I passed in a shortcut, and I'm going to delete this one because that was that MPG that I created. And I now have some file called .mpf. Now, to open up a file, it's as simple as hitting the blue arrow to the right, or on the vertical soft key, you can hit the open button. Either one will do it. And I'm now viewing that, that ASCII text file, or right, a text file that we just started creating, right? So here is the program. So nobody says that I can't start to validate it here right now. So maybe I want to run it. So I'm going to go to an execute. We're going to hit cycle start like we were doing on the machine. And in this case, I'm getting a block 12 illegal end of block. So I probably have some funky syntax in here. Now this is where having, uh, it doesn't like something here. Having end numbers would make things a little better, right? It just said block 12. Now I knew that was block 12 because I'm looking in the upper right hand corner here. But if I had an end number, then it could show me the line. And I am still getting an illegal end of block. Let's put some end numbers in here. Now, what's nice with the control and the editor, I can add sequence numbers to the program here as well. So let's just try that. Okay. Now, if you start to get some weird alarms, 
and I, I run into this from time to time, I don't love trying to run programs from external memory. So I usually will get into the habit of copying my file and dropping it somewhere within the system's memory. So I'm just going to go to Part Programs, paste the program file over, and then run it. So if you get a command that just doesn't seem to make sense, like right now we see it's running fine, gives me my cavity mill, no alarms, everything's good. It could be because you're trying to run it on an external memory source. So that's just a simple, quick example of as you start to post and you start to you know, drop programs in externally, just bring them over to what we call internal memory. And internal memory is anything in this NC folder. So it's as simple as just hit copy or cut and hit paste. The other nice part about that is because I have to be real careful if I'm inside and editing the file and then I jump to my cam system and I start trying to post into it. Because now Sinutrain is editing a file I'm trying to write over. And then they're going to start to fight each other. So there's a couple benefits to bringing your files into NC memory. Uh, but I would certainly say probably get into that habit. Okay. So we have the start of a, a basic program here. We've started to work through our formatting. So now let's take a look at some additional features. Now one of the things that's pretty cool about the message command that a lot of guys don't realize is you can also push in variables to it. So if you want to get a little more sophisticated in your messaging, maybe you had a probing routine or something else that, that went in, wrote to a variable, in this case we're using just one of our R variables, you can display any system variables inside the message command and it's as simple as just what we call incantinating the variable. So it can't be inside of the parentheses anymore. That's only going to be the text I'm directly dropping. If I had all this in the parentheses, then I would see less than less than R1, and I wouldn't want that. So after my quote is done, put these two less than symbols. That's what's called incantinating the variable, and then type in whatever the variable is. Now, I'm using an R variable, but if there's a system variable you want to grab that you know of, you can plug the system variable right in, and then the result of that variable will display in the message command as well. Okay, so once we've started our safety line, once we created our, you know, our basic workpiece blank, maybe give it some user messages, the next step is sending the machine to a safe location. And I see this in posts all the time. There tends to be a lot of confusion as to how do we drive the machine to a safe spot. So in the Siemens control, you're going to use the command called SUPA. So SUPA is your first exposure to what we call verbal commands. And in the Siemens control, we have a lot of ISO-based commands like G0 and G1 and G2 and G3. But we also have a lot of verbal commands. And a verbal command is really just an acronym. So in this case, this is an abbreviation for suppression of the active frames or active coordinate system. So what it's doing for me is it's basically disabling my work coordinate system allowing me to move the machine in relation to the machine coordinate system. Now, a lot of times you see guys that use G53 or G153, like you see on the right side of the screen. So we have three different commands that do almost the same thing. And generally speaking, when you see different commands like this, it's a legacy thing. So we had G53 was our first command that suppressed frames, but then we developed more frames in the system. So then we created G153. But then we grow up more frames. So SUPA is our highest level command, and it's going to suppress the maximum number of offsets that I possibly can. And, and from your side, from a CAD-CAM side, that's what you want to do. You want to try to disable as much as you can. It's a non-modal command, so I have to have SUPA on every line as I'm moving through. And it will not cancel tool offsets. So that's where this D0 comes in. That's canceling the active tool offset. But once I've done the super command and cancel my tool offset, I can then tell the system how I want to move. In my case, I'm using a G0, where to go, and it'll drive to that location. Now, if I want to move my X and Y here, I'm not too worried about my tool offset, so I can just drive my X and Y to a given location. Now, SUPA is a great command, but the problem you run into is you tend to have a lot of SUPA statements throughout a part program. And from a user perspective, they tend to be jumping all over the place. So here is a great time to get into using what we call local variables. So this would be a custom variable that you built that only exists during the run of the program that allows you to then feed a value into the super commands, 
like you see in this little example, but I'm doing it from the header of the program, right, the beginning of the program. So a user can say, oh, well, I, I know the, the, the value that the CAM system pushed. It told me to send everything to machine zero, but that's not optimal on this specific machine. Now, instead of him having to edit potentially 30, 40, 50, who God only knows how many supas that exist throughout the program every time I wanted to send it to a safe location, I do it at the top. I make my change where it says, in this case, underscore Z home or X home, and then it will automatically make that adjustment for me. So in the part program, it's really as, as basic as doing this type of command. So when I want to build variables, I need a definition statement like you see here, and I need to set my variables. So let's jump over to our part program. We'll go into sample one. Now, with that statements, definition statements, that's what's creating the variable. That does have to exist before any other code. Now, you can have some comments. So if I wanted to, I could have a semicolon, and I could say program, number, blah, 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 whatever I want, right? But I can't have any motion code. If my safety line was above this definition statement, it would alarm out. It would give me an error message. So if you're going to build local variables, do it right at the top. Now, we do have to tell it the type of variable. So it's a real. It means it's a real number. Or it's, it's not an integer. It's not going to round it. And then just basically give it the variables you want. So if you're going to create or define more than one variable on the line, just add a comma between each one. I always like to start my variables with an underscore. This way I don't potentially use an already system variable that exists. Now, when it's time to set the variables, it really doesn't matter where this, this statement is. So that, the setting of it, that could be anywhere I want. That could be all the way down here if I wanted to. Um, doesn't make any difference, but I do want to make sure I set them prior to actually executing the code. So once I, once I have that in place, then I'm going to want to define the super command. And the super command is going to be that position move that's going to happen. Um, really, it's going to be my first move in the program. So I'm sending the machine to some kind of a safe place. Now, you see my sequence numbers are getting all out of sequence just because I'm cutting and pasting. That's okay. It would run. Uh, at the end of the day, I would probably want to have them formatted properly. So I would handle that inside of the CAM system or in the control. I can just do a basic renumbering and let it resequence those line numbers. But here, when I'm going to set a variable to a specific command, it's a matter of just telling it the axis I want to link to the variable and an equal sign. And then I can come in and give it the variable. This would be no different than if I wanted to do simple math in an axis to, you know, like 1 plus 2, and then the machine would move to 3 or something along those lines. So give it your super command. And now the machine will drive to some set location. So it's driving to 10, 5, and 4. So if I was to run this part program, I see I'm sitting at some other location. I run it. There's my cavity mill. And here's my move to this location. Now, that is a value based on machine coordinates. So if I was to toggle the machine coordinates on, I would see I'm still at that location. I don't have any work coordinate active on the control right now. So machine and work are the same value. But if I did have an active work coordinate, this number displaying in work and the value I told Supa to go to would be two different locations because this is always driving based on the suppression of all the work coordinates. Okay. So we have our beginning programs. We've positioned the machine to a safe location. So what's next that my post has to handle? Well, probably tool change. And tool change is important to kind of get your head around. So we have two different methods of doing tool changes within the Siemens control. You can do named or numerical tool call. So that is where we're showing you the T equals, right? We have this value over here and we can go into the full slide, might read a little better. We have the T equals and cutter 10, or we have a T and a number. So the way this works as far as in a standard milling configuration, there's always gonna be exceptions, but in standard milling configuration, the name that's inside the quotes will relate to whatever the tool was named at. So I mentioned before we're going to build a tool. We'll do one right here in a second. Now, if I want to use strictly numerical formatting, which a lot of users prefer, then you don't have to call the tool any name. You just give it the number in the name field. Just keep in mind, this number has no bearing on the pocket location. 
because if I'm in a random pocket location or random tool changer, tool five could be all over the place. So it's always relating to whatever the name is. So if you have just a numerical value, you don't need the equals and the quotes. You can put them if you want, but it's, it's not required. Next step would be to trigger the tool change macro. Um, now, the macro can change by OEMs, but I would say the most common would be using an M6. Now, when it comes to syntax within the control, if there's a leading zero, I don't need to put it. I can. So I can type M6. I can type M06. Either one's fine. Now, that's going to actually activate the physical tool change. So the prior T code, that would actually handle what we refer to as prefetching. Right? So if it sees either the T5 or the T cutter 10, the carousel is going to start to start spinning around and getting the tool ready to load. So if you want to do prefetching after the tool change is all said and done, you can do another T code, but just don't follow it up by an M6, and that'll prefetch the carousel right around. Once the tool change is complete with the M6, then I want you guys to get into the habit of activating the current offset of the tool. So this is a little different than ISO. You guys are used to activating a number here that matches the named number of the tool. It's not that way in Siemens. For any tool you build, whether it's a named tool or a numerical tool, you can build up to nine unique offsets for the tool. And they are toggled from D1 through D9. So within that structure, that means that you're always going to start with D1 unless you want to build or pull up a different offset. So it doesn't matter what the tool number it is or name is, you start with D1 because that's the first offset assigned to that tool. Now, once we start adding in functions, it's nice to get your head around what we call the group command. And a group is really just a way of expanding or compressing code quickly uh, at the machine tool. And it allows me to then, as an editor or as a user, see large chunks of code quickly and easily because it, it's compressing them. So here I'm just giving you an example of the group command. Now when you want to build a group, and the group's going to display like you see here, and I can expand or compress in our editor, it's always going to start with this, sec, this text. So it's group underscore begin, the number zero, whatever I want the name of the group to be within quotes, and followed by two final zeros. When you get to more complex machines, these other values, well, they'll come into play when you have multiple spindle machines and you're moving things around. But in a standard single-channel milling machine, you don't need any other values other than giving it a unique name for the group. And then from there, the bottom of the group is going to end with a group end, open close parentheses, and two zeros. By adding this text in, that's going to allow you to actually, and I'm going to bring up my program because we'll do it over here. We'll do it with our little sample one. And we'll open this up maybe in Notepad. I'm going to open it with Notepad. All right. So there's our simple program. So we're going to add in the message command because I want you to see how the syntax looks from your posting perspective and then how the, the control is actually going to interpret it. So if we come out of here, I want to just grab this text. So we're going to grab all the super command. Um, the tool change. I'm going to drop that in our part program. So in this case, we'll say right about there. Okay. So see, it looks just like I'm showing you in the editor, right? But you're not going to see all this extra text in the physical machine. So let's save that file, jump over to Train. And now if I open up, and remember, I got to go to my network drive because I haven't updated the one in internal memory. But if I open up this one right now, you see I don't see the group commands, but immediately I come in and things are compressed. And now I can toggle them open and close just by clicking with my mouse, using my blue arrows, a bunch of ways to do it. There's even some shortcut commands to expand everything in one try. But now I can add or compress all of this stuff in one shot. So here we're starting to build a basic program, right? We got some header lines, we have a safety retract, we did a tool change in here. Now before I run this, you know, if I had given this something that maybe didn't exist in the machine's library, if I go to run a program now from that state, 
it's going to tell me that the tool is not available. Um, now let me move it over to internal memory. Put it over here. We'll just write over the one we had. So we execute the program, cycle start. Uh, do -do. Oh, I probably have a an error in my do -do -do text. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I wiped out our definition statement. So remember, we added the definition statement earlier to create the variables. So I'm just going to get rid of these for the time being. You have to have defined the variables. So my Z home, X and Y, or X and Z home. But if I didn't build the tool properly, you're going to get an alarm through the, for the cutter or the alarm that's not existing. So the simplest way for you guys to start building basic tools so you can keep proving out your code, um, first, if you got a name, whether it's up in the comments, I like to put them up in the comments so I don't have to hunt for them, but I want to use this name in the creation of my tool. So simply just highlight it, copy, and go over to the offsets table. That's this, this button over here It says offsets. And now I can have a pre-created tool table. Now there's been a bunch of tools already built in here. So if I want to build a new tool, I want to make sure I'm on the tool list area, go to a blank spot, and click new tool. And new tool, you're going to build, you're going to pick the type of tool you want to build. So most part, you guys are probably going to be building end mills or twist drills. So pick the tool, say OK. Now, if the auto naming is already turned on, just delete it. And it is in this default machine. And now I can paste in the cutter 50 that I just pulled out. Want to give it some default tool length. I'm going to throw maybe five inches in, and then certainly diameter. So, you know, maybe I knew that this was a one inch diameter. Type in the one inch diameter. That's all you really need to be able to build a tool enough to keep validating your tool code, uh, your, your program inside of the system. So now it knows cutter 50 exists. It's got some basic length, and more importantly, it has a diameter here. Because when we get to cutter comp, that's going to be important. So now we can come back into the program, simulate it, and now she's going to start running through, and it did the tool change for cutter 50. Okay, so we're moving along here. So we built up some syntax. I would take a look at the groups command. It's a handy function to start using. Now we get to feeds and feeds and M codes. So there's a bunch of different formats you're going to see. I'm going to pick out the most popular specific for this technology, right? And keep in mind, we're a three-axis, single-channel milling machine. So here we have our spindle commands, and I would just use a standard S command for my spindle RPM. You may see S in a number and then equal signs or set MS. So this is when you start to deal with multiple spindle machines. So we're going to handle that in some, some later seminars. But if I'm doing just a basic um, single spindle type of machine, it's just an S and my RPM number. And then I'm going to associate it with certainly some M code. right? So these are predefined M codes within the Siemens system. Certainly when we get to M codes especially, OEMs love to build all kinds of custom M codes to do different commands. Um, chip augers, wash downs, through spindle coolant, I mean, you name it. So these are the out-of-the-box M codes that you have available. So our stop commands, op stop, program stop, M0, M01. These are all really common commands that you guys are used to. M2, M30, both would relate to end of program. Really no difference anymore. There's no more rewinding a tape kind of thing. Um, we do have an M17. That's end of sub. So if you get into writing subroutines, you'd use an M17. All of my spindle commands would be the standard M3, M4, M5, right? Clockwise, counterclockwise, or stop. M6 handles tool changing of my tool and my spindle. M19 and M70, that's when I get to positioning the spindle. Um, so generally speaking, most three-axis mills use M19 as some form of a spindle orient, but not always. So if you want to start orienting the spindle for any reason in your toolpath, it's something you're going to want to check with the machine builder OEM if they're supporting M19 or they're using an s pause, which is another popular command to position the spindle. Coolant commands, right? all your standard M7, 8, and 9. And then obviously our gear ratio commands. So generally speaking, you're just going to type the M, M2, M30, 
Again, you don't need the leading zero, but you can put it. Nothing says you can't put M03. Um, if you get to multiple spindles, then you have to go to multiple mapping of M codes, and that's that example with the M1 equals 3. So for us, we're not doing that right now. But what we are going to do is either set up G94 feed per minute or G95 feed per rev. You can support either or. And when you're doing it, then it's as simple as just telling it the feed per minute and the feed rate with an F command. Or if I get to feed per rev, I'm still going to use an F, but now I'm going to use a revolu revolutions per minute scenario, right? So 5 thou per rev, 10 thou per rev, and that'll be the distance I would move for every revolution that the spindle spins. Or you can set up feed per tooth. Now feed per tooth is this command on our far right. So we got the G95 FC equals, right? And then this syntax. Now, the feed per tooth is only going to work when inside of Sinutrain or, or at the real machine, when they build tools, they give it number of cutting edges. So that's how we would do the calculation. Um, other than that, certainly I wouldn't know what the multiplier is. Um, I would say most commonly uh, from a, oops, sorry, let me go back to the full slides. Um, most commonly from a posting perspective, you're going to see either feed per minute or feed per rev. Feed per rev is real handy when we're dealing with drilling applications. But we do have a whole host of additional feed commands. Um, G93, inverse time, feed groups, um, feed group references. This stuff comes into play when you get to more rotary axes. So for now, from a linear perspective, just concentrate on G94, 95. But if you need to start supporting rotary axes, look at different feed scenarios, then you can get into either inverse time or I would say more importantly, getting into what we call our feed groups. But that could be an hour discussion on its own. So once we set up our M codes, our speeds and feeds, then from an interpolation standpoint, it's pretty standard. So there's not a lot to teach you guys here. Um, we're supporting our standard uh, rapids and feeds, our linear interpolations, G0, G1. Circular interpolation, we'll look at that in a sec, but that's my G2 and G3. Um, now, it's important to note that by default, G0 is an interpolated move. So that means when I tell it to go somewhere, it's going to get to that point at, at all three, three axes. You're going to get there simultaneously. So what that means is the only axis that's really running at full rapid is the axis that's going to move the furthest distance. All the other axes are going to have to go a little bit slower so they don't get there first. Now, it is possible to disable that in the control. Um, if you do run into that, I would say reach out to me. I can certainly tell you guys how, from a programming syntax, you could uh, compensate for that. But that has to do with that RTLION or IOF command you see at the bottom of the page, this uh, RTLION IOF. So that's rapid traverse linear interpolation on or rapid traverse linear interpolation off. There you could change that behavior, but it's safest to obviously allow G0 to interpolate. Um, G1 is always an interpolated move. So if I have multiple axes on the line, that feed line, they're going to get to that same point at the same time. Now my arcs, there's a bunch of ways to create arcs within the cinematic control, but the two that you need to support from the posting perspective would be IJK, so um, endpoint and circle center, or endpoint and radius. So what you're looking at right now is this is endpoint and circle center. All right. So here I have two methods within the control. By default, the IJK are going to be incremental dimensions and that's a distance from the endpoint of my arc to the center of my circle. If you want to set the center of your circle as an absolute position, we also support that, but that's where you would use that AC syntax. So in the bottom example, right down here on the second line 20, you see I equals AC 50 or J equals AC 50. That's telling us that the center point for I is an absolute value. And in theory, you could intermix. Generally speaking, I find most posts that we set up, we set up using incremental centers, such as standard IJ. And again, it's the distance from the endpoint to the center. I know some controls interpret that a little differently. Now, if you want to do endpoint radius, our syntax is slightly different than the ISO standard. 
So we use endpoint as my X, Y, and Z, but my circle is CR, or my radius is not R in a value, it's CR equals, so circle radius equals, and then the radial value. Other than that, it's going to work exactly the same as you guys are, are used to. So I have a little program pre-stage here just to show you what that syntax would look like. So inside of Sinutrain, and if you guys want any of these samples, by all means, I know we're covering a lot in a short time frame, reach out to me and I'd be happy to share them. But I'm going to do a couple different methods. So it's a basic toolpath. Here you can see simulation with the workpiece blank turned on. Right? So we're just walking around and cutting four arcs in each corner. But the difference is I did each of those arcs with a different process. So this first one right here, that's endpoint and radius. So there's your CR equals. So we're doing a one inch radius. Then we're doing the incremental, your IJK scenario on the second arc. Then we also show included angles and three point circle interpolation. But again, I would say one of these two, or sometimes I find a post will select or have the ability of supporting both, it's pretty common, would be the preferred method of doing arc interpolation. So once you build that, generally the next step that you run into with arc interpolation is, well, how do I interpolate in an XZ or a YZ orientation? And this always throws guys for a loop because immediately you're going to say, okay, well, I got to initiate a G18 or a G19 and not in our control. So what G18 and G19 do is actually switch the way the tool is pointing or how we're interpreting the tool is pointing. And we use that really for cutter comp purposes. So in the Siemens control, you can at any time give it a, um, an arc with an X, Z, or Y, Z orientation and the system can then handle it all the while staying in G17. So you see this little example, we got G17 active, and I'm sweeping an arc in an XZ orientation, and then I came back and did an XZ with an IJK, and we just worked our way around it. So either orientation is gonna work all the while staying in my G17. It's important to understand this because this always messes post guys up. So here I'm in G17, I take a little look at the part program real fast, and you're gonna see we're going to, let's go into 3D, and I'll just uh, zoom into this a little bit so you guys can see it. So now when I run, so there's our sweeping R2 arcs. If I looked at the top view, this is my top view, so I was definitely in an XY or an XZ plane. If you look at it from maybe a front view, and you see the, the first arc and then the second arc. Now watch what would have happened if we had changed, and I'm just going to do it for everything, but we had changed the tool plane. When I go to simulate it, see how the tool is now pointed in a different direction? It's pointed right at that geometry. So would this program have run? yeah, it would have still run, but you're not actually applying it properly. So you do not have to, nor do we want you to change the orientation unless you have like a right angle head and then you want to transpose the can cycles and more importantly, cutter comp to work in that plane orientation. Okay. So lesson of the day, stay in your tool plane the whole time. You don't have to keep flipping it back and forth for arc interpolation. Now we're going to come in and take a look at cutter comp real quick. So cutter comp is going to work like you guys are used to. Um, G40, 41, 42, that's, that's all normal. Um, what, I, what I'm going to say is one of the things you don't have to worry about within our control is having a lead-in um, value or, or distance greater than the radius of the tool. It doesn't have to be. It can certainly be smaller than the radius of the tool. I think naturally you tend to probably lead into your part if you have the room bigger. Uh, but what we don't support, uh, just so you know, is you can't turn cutter comp on during an arc move. So it does have to be in a linear move. You can turn it on a rapid. You can turn it on actually in a Z direction move. Sometimes I do that. I just can't do it with an arc command. But then it's going to work as, you know, as we should be expecting. So a G41 is going to shift the tool to the left. G42 would shift it to the right in relation of the tool path, the direction of my tool path. Now, 
What's more of a pain point is when you deal with what we call cutter comp wear. And this is very common in a CAD CAM system post, right? A lot of times users like to use the wear strategy um, this way that the CAM system knows spatially the, the full tool path, right? And then the output code isn't going to be the geometry of the part, but it's actually going to be the center line path of the tool. So like we would see on the side on the right. The problem is, if I want to use our simulation and I define the full tool diameter, I end up with double compensation. So here you can use a command in your G-code called TOFFR. And what it does is it allows us to adjust the active um, radius value for the active tool. So in my example, we're using a half-inch end mill. And I am in the post validating whether or not I've chosen or the user has chosen a wear strategy for cutter comp. And if we do, since I know we're going to have full diametric values at the control, I basically remove the value that was already plugged in. This way I can have a full radius at my control. So let me show you kind of how that whole thing works. So if I'm in my part program and I'm looking at the standard comp where I have no TOF of R command. So I have a half inch end mill. If I look at my tool table, my half inch end mill was built with a full value. So if I ran it, we would see the exact same thing as my image. I'm shifted from my part now by the radius of the cutter. See how I'm not touching anything? I'm shifted off in space. So that's not what I wanted, right? Now I'm, my parts are all oversized by the radius. But unfortunately, if I do what my first instinct would be, which would be just to zero out the tool diameter, which would be normally how you would use a wear strategy, now I have really no simulation because the control has no idea what the size of the tool is. So see, I'm walking around it. It would cut properly, but I don't have any simulation. Also, and this is probably more where this is a problem for a user, I now have to manage tools two different ways in geometry. So if I'm doing any shop floor programming or anything down on the machine tool, I'm probably going to want to have my tool diameters there. But then when I go to my KCAM program, I have to delete all my diameters. So that's where you can use the TOFFR command. So it's as simple as really just before you instate cutter comp, or really at any time after you've loaded the tool, I can say, I know that I want to modify the active tool radius by the radius I know I offset in cam. So here, if I have the full diameter, since the tool path, I'm going to stay in simulation. Since the tool path, I am jumping all over the place, already had compensated for that tool radius, I'm just really removing the radius. So now you notice my cutter's right on the side of my part. Now the beauty about this now is although I output tool path based on a half inch tool, from the controls perspective, I can actually change the geometry of my tool and the part program still runs. I don't have to worry about reposting it because you still have cutter comp and it'll still handle properly. So we come in, and now I'm making a one-inch tool. And you see, I still worked right around. It would affect my entry and exit a little bit, so you got to be careful there. But you notice I didn't overcut the geometry. So it's really allowing the operator, the user, a lot more control at the system. I would say this is a function where you may want to add what we refer to as a post switch to be able to turn this on or off. Not all users are going to want to use it this way. Um, but I think more that understand how it works are going to want to adopt this type of strategy. Because tool wear is, is very, very common, uh, as you guys certainly well know, as a strategy from the CAD CAM system. So that's the best way, I would say, to handle this was with this TOFFR, rewriting the active radius of this, you know, the tool that's in the spindle. Now, it doesn't rewrite the physical tool in the tool table. Okay, so one of the things that, you know, gets can be a little confusing is all these slight differences between standard ISO codes and Siemens codes. So we do have a really handy tool as you guys start getting into developing more posts that you can use as a reference, and that is actually what we call our Easy CNC app. So it's available for both Android and for Apple. 
right in the in the you know in this in the store right? the Apple Store or the the Droid the Android or Google Google Play Store, and you can download this app free of charge. And from here, you can go in and you can plug in any command, whether it be ISO or Siemens, and it'll show you the alternate for the command. So, like, if you weren't sure if G81 was really the equivalent of Cycle 81, you can come into the app and it'll tell you that. There's a whole lot of other things in the app that's worth checking out. But I would certainly say um, download the app, get it on your phone or your tablet, and it's a great reference as you're starting to build up this syntax, build up these posts, and you want to quickly see, okay, well, I couldn't remember what the unit of measure in Siemens was. Is it you know, G70 or 700? All that is going to be listed right within this app, as well as a bunch of other information. And that leads us into getting into CAN cycles. Now, CAN cycles are, um, are certainly very in-depth, um, and we could spend an hour and a half just talking about CAN cycles. But I wanted to show you guys um, what, um, you know, how you can start to use the document at least to decipher the CAN cycle. So the first thing when you get to any cycle is you're going to have this comma delimited string. So I would say do yourself a favor and kind of map out the string and how many numerical values are part of that string. So in this case, for standard cycle 81, you have nine variables that are available within this string. So as you look through the document, we're then going to mention to you which are direct drop-ins. So, you know, like here we have RTP is variable one. Well, that's my retraction plane. So that's where I want to tell the tool to go when I'm done. Reference point, which would be the second variable. Well, that's where I'm drilling from. So in this case, top of my part, maybe Z0. Safety clearance is my third variable. That's how close I wrap it to the system before I start feeding in. I have a drill depth. Now, when you look at the description, and again, you're going to go to job planning, like I mentioned, and you're going to look at the external cycle programming chapter. If you see a note that relates to like a G mode, A mode, D mode, that is saying that the behavior of this variable will be impacted by this additional variable. So, that is a variable, like 7, 8, and 9, that you would not see displayed in the cycle mask at the control. But what it does is it changes the behavior of the cycle. So if you look at G mode, G mode's a pretty straightforward one. And that's telling me that how am I positioning my tool? Am I just going right down to the Z1 variable, which is an index 4? Or am I actually doing a is that actually a diametric value, and I'm doing a calculation. So the cycle has the ability, um, if you tell it the tip angle when you build the drill, and it knows the drill size, it can calculate how far down it would need to move a drill to you know, spot a face to a quarter-inch diameter, let's say. So more times than not, from a CAD-CAM perspective, you're just disabling this stuff, right? So here, if I choose a value of zero, that means that the Z1 value is always going to be a depth, and that's what you would want. You would want it to be a depth. So there's a lot here, you guys. As you get into more post-development, you can always reach out to me, and I can help you out. Um, but really the big thing is understanding that if there is a reference on the description to a different integer variable, that is telling you that that variable can change the state at this variable. So there's a few different things. We have my plane orientation. We have whether our Z depths are absolute or incremental. So these are the little triggers and these are the nuances when you're first figuring out how a cycle is going to work within our system. This is the stuff that always trips guys up. But once you kind of get your head around it and get, get used to how the manual is formatted, formatted, all the information is really right here for you. And if, if you're having trouble with it, reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to work you guys through these scenarios. So this would be the structure of any of our CAN cycles. The reality is you're going to use, generally speaking, um, outside of you know a few peripheral, when I get to drilling and tapping, you're going to use CAN cycles. Milling, you're generally not going to use any CAN cycles for geometry per se, even though we have a whole library of them. But I would say you're going to want your post to definitely support um, our standard drilling cycles, our 
our tapping cycles. Those are all the things that the user is going to want to use at the control. So here's an example of what a toolpath would look like. Here we're showing you a three or four axis geometry. So the cycle itself, if you just have the cycle with no M call, this is referred to as a modal call, then what's going to happen is this, this, the, system, the system's really just going to drill wherever you're sitting. So in my case, it would drill at zero, zero, center of my block. Once it sees this command M call on the line with the cycle, and you guys are going to have to build that from the post side, then it's saying anything positioned between this M call and an additional M call, that's where I'm going to drill my holes. So here I got four different coordinates, and it's going to run this drilling cycle at all four coordinates. So an M call on the end is very similar to a G80, which you're used to. The only difference is you're not, you know, used to obviously having to put like an equivalent G80 on the line. So it's just give it the M call on the same line as the cycle, and now you're modally drilling. Certainly, if you did have rotary moves required, they can be inside those those locations, and the machine's going to position and then and then redrill that hole. What you can't do is you can't change the drilling depth. You know, like I, I get that asked to me from time to time because some ISO controls allow you to change the drilling depth midstream by just adding a new Z depth on here. Um, that you, you can't do within our cycles because the drilling depth is handled internally inside the cycle. So I would need to do a unique drilling cycle for that hole that needed a new depth. Okay, so that's how your drilling is going to start to work. All right, so we can start to build our CAN cycles. The coordinates, you don't need decimal points, um, but you certainly can put them. You don't need to run out X amount of decimal places here, but you can if you need to. So the next command that we're going to touch upon briefly is our high-speed cycle, cycle 832. And this trips a lot of guys up from a post-development standpoint. But this is what activates our uh, high speed functionality. And high speed is um, a little misleading sometimes. Um, this doesn't necessarily always have to be fast. This could also be a quality or a tolerance thing. But we basically have three different modes within this cycle that allow you to control um, the result of your toolpath. So when using cycle 832, you have to tell us a couple of different things. You have to tell us a chordal tolerance all right, or a contour tolerance, that's your first decimal place, so that's your first variable index. You need to tell us a machining strategy, and there's three basic strategies. And then this last value, you're always going to set to a value of one. Now, you can use this to feed in a five axis machine. This can be your orientation tolerance. But generally, when I'm building a post, even a five axis, I like to call out my orientation tolerance as a separate line. So I would say you're really only going to support two variables. The third one you're always going to leave as one when you're building in the cycle 832. The tolerance and then the strategy. Now, there's two different formats, and, and this is what throws guys off for this second variable. I can have a actual verbal command, or I can have a numerical value. And although from a readability standpoint, the, the actual... Um, verbal statement reads a little better. You can run into compatibility if you're trying to write a post that's going to work in a larger range of cycles. We only started supporting this verbal command uh, in a little later versions of software. So the earlier versions of software used a numerical value. So when I methodize my posts or when I work with post developers, I always recommend using the numerical value. This way the post has a better chance of running even on older control systems. So that would be what's shown right here in this, this further example to the right. So I have my chordal tolerance, and then I have my strategy. A number two is a semi-finishing or a rough finishing strategy. And the last one's always going to sit at a value of one. Now, when you get to starting to work, especially in high-speed commands, there's a few things that we always recommend. Uh, one thing, once cycle 832 is turned on, you want to have all of your toolpath be linearized, so no arc commands. It'll run, but it may not calculate the spline that it's, it's actually running in the background properly. So generally speaking, you turn cycle 832 on, make sure all commands are linearized. 
Within that, these are the defaults we recommend, especially when like surfacing and stuff like that. So for linear axes, if you're programming a metric, a minimum of five places. If you're programming an inch, we want you to run out a minimum of six places. Now that doesn't mean that every every coordinate is going to go out six places if they're all zero. It's only if that number can be held out to six places, we want you to put it out to six places. And what this does is this alleviates um, rounding error. And it's amazing how many surface problems occur and speed problems occur because lines just don't match up because you have rounding error between the data that the CAM system was holding, maybe a value that was, was truncated by the post processor and then dropped into control. And you start rounding things down to three and four decimal places, you can lose a lot of quality. It's going to affect your precision. More importantly, it's going to affect your speed. So believe it or not, by adding the potential of number of units in your coordinates, you can get the programs to run faster. And a lot of guys think that's counterintuitive, right? If there's more data, it should run slower. Not, not in our control by any means. Same thing with rotary axes. Six places, certainly both for metric or inch unless you have a special control that runs different metric degrees. Um, when I get the point density, you know, this is always up for debate, but I would say as a, a base recommendation, we say start with around a 12 thou per inch point density, so that's the distance from point to point. And if you don't know what to set the chordal tolerance to, I mean, generally speaking, you want to match this to the CAM system. So if you guys know what your chordal tolerance is, I would say plug it in. If you don't, use this as a default. So for roughing, four thousandths of an inch. For semi-finish, two thousandths of an inch. And finishing, I would say anywhere from half a thou or uh, two tenths to 80 millionths. Um, so usually I, I set it to two tenths um, by default. So if you guys don't know, you're building your cycle call for cycle 32 and you need to know what to set that quartal tolerance for, use this as your baseline. Obviously, the metric equivalents would apply as well. So 4 thou, 2 thou, or 2 tenths uh, as your default values. And then the user can certainly tweak them if they want to you know, play around and see if they can get either better, you know, faster feed rates or better surface finishes. But that's really your starting point. OK, so we're, we're almost done. So a couple other things. Now, in this case, we're going to now handle what occurs before a mid-program tool change, so as an end of operation. So I always like to cancel my Cycle 832 if I've been using it. If you haven't, so you haven't been using it, no point in adding a cancel Cycle 832. To cancel Cycle 832, it's as simple as really just zeroing out the tolerance, but more importantly, put the operation state to a zero and then always leave that third digit as number one. This is going to cancel cycle A32. Now, I think we mentioned it earlier, but certainly I can have multiple M codes on the same line. So we can do up to five. So here I can do an M5 and an M9, shuts my spindle off, shuts my coolant off. And then I may want to send my machine to my safety position. Now, this is a good case where I might want to use a block skip. So if you want to use a block skip in the control, it's just a basic forward slash like you're used to in standard ISO controls. Um, here then, I'm probably going to want to maybe drive some kind of user message. This would be a great area that if I wanted to add some op stops and tell a user, hey, you know, check dimension whatever, or clean out some chips. And then I would normally, if I'm going to build a user message, probably clear it, because I really only want the user message visible if the guy's using an M01 state. So right after, I can do a message clear. And this is pretty standard how I would want to handle between each tool change. You know, certainly the, the tool change itself is going to handle sending the spindle to its appropriate location. Um, so that's why I don't necessarily always need this staging location unless I have like a big fixture or something and I want to make sure I send everything to a safe spot. That's a, a good example of where I'd want to have my super commands. So that's why I, sometimes I like to use a block skip. When you get to the tool change, you're just going to come in. It's going to be basically the same syntax like you used before. So your T equals in quotes if you're using named tools. If you're using number, just T in the number. Issue your M6. Always start with your D1. If you guys can support multiple cutting edges in your CAM system, then we can incorporate different D switches. Set up your M codes and your S codes. 
and your feed rate and continue on in the program. And then at the end, I would probably use the exact same scenario that I used for my prior to tool. The only difference here is you may want to add yourself in a T0 to clear the spindle. Um, and that's something that certainly it's really up to the user if they want to then execute or not. You know, if if you're doing high production and the last tool is the same as the first tool, well, we just added in a duplicate, uh, an extra tool change we wouldn't want. Um, but if I'm doing low volume production um, or, you know, overnight running and I don't want to leave a tool sitting in the spindle, then you can always clear it. So a T0 M6, yes, they can be on the same line if you would like them to. That is a quick, easy method for clearing the spindle. Then we use our super, again, to stage us in a safe spot. If you want to have a separate variable for like a pre-staging location for part loading, then this would be a great example of maybe creating a, a different local variable like we did before. And then we could use that as our end position. You know, maybe we can call it underscore X end or something along those lines. So this way a user could potentially set up two separate locations, a safety retract and then a final staging location for part loading or unloading. And then we ended up with a simple M30 to end the program. Okay, so we started looking at it. I wanted to just kind of wrap this whole thing up with showing you a real working example of a post that's been methodized in this format. So here I have a program that was posted using this format. We posted this out of actually Mastercam. We do quite a, quite a bit of work with Mastercam developing some posts. So this is what we would expect a 2D program to look like. So first and foremost, you can start to see the beauty of using the groups. Look how, how quickly I can look at this whole program. I can see all my tools, but then once I start to expand, I can get into all my meat. And you see how much larger the part program starts to get as we start to expand all these different tool paths. So the groups is a, just a great way to make your output code a little more friendly to the operators and people that are going to be running it down on the floor. In this case, we put all our comments in the top. We did want to keep our naming terminology right here so I could quickly maybe you know copy and paste and build tools in my tool library like we saw before. So we'll just do a quick new tool. And remember, you can always cut and paste right in here real fast. We give it some simple offsets. All right. I don't need any other data. So that's a quick way for me to start to build my tools by having the names handy for me. So we're going to build these three because I don't think they're in the system now. If I want to build a drill, you're not really letting the cycle unless you build your cycle to do it, doing any kind of compensation. So it really doesn't matter if you build it as a drill or an end mill. We'll still let you drill with an end mill. But if you want to get a little more accurate, I would use the drill, you know, the, the drill option under new tool. So here we have two drills. We have a three ace drill as well. Now, if you happen to duplicate a tool in your library, what will happen is you're going to see that this sister tool command will actually go to another number. And that means you've, you've duplicated it. So for your purposes, you don't want to ever see this index to another number. That means it's there somewhere. It already exists in the library. So I would just delete it and let it use the one that was previously there. You can put fractions in when you're creating your tools. So we have a simple little program. We can simulate it. In this case, we used our cutter comp scenario. So now we're clearing. We're bringing it up to a given size. Now, it happened when we built this post that we output the TOFFR command multiple times, that's okay. It's not going to keep accruing the value. So let me show you what I mean. Um, here we get into our milling toolpath. I expand, and you see how we have TOFFR there. And then I come down, and I have another one here. So this doesn't accrue. This is just rewriting the radius. So you can just do it once. But, you know, it was easier when we wrote the post to just, set, just keep outputting it at the beginning of each of the operations for multiple depth of pass. It's not going to hurt you. But it is a radial value. So if your offset table is set up diametrically and you guys are, you know, this still always programs radially, right? So I have 375 there for a tool that was built 
as a three quarters diameter. Now, when you look back at the program and we get to drilling, this is where having sinew train is going to be a lifesaver for you guys. Because, you know, you're going to fight with these cycles. And, and I mean, it's just the nature of the beast when you're first getting used to them. So the easiest way for you to start debugging your, your cycles and your code is come into sinew train, go to the cycle, and open it up. If you've made a mistake, this is going to light up like a Christmas tree. You're going to have red lines. It's going to be telling you alarms. So if you made any errors in this, see if I can induce an error. If you ever want to edit inside a cycle, just hit Shift and Insert. So let's say I made that one positive. So boom. Right there it's saying, well, how is my, you know, my, my Z retract or the top of my drilling higher than my retract plane? That's a problem. Right? So, so this is where you'll start to see these, these different values with, within the cycle. And you can kind of use our mask to debug your cycle. So then you either go into your post, fix it there, uh, maybe you just come in. Now what's, other, what's neat too is let's say I said, oh, okay, we wanted this to be negative, whatever it was, right? I correct it here, I hit accept. It's also going to rebuild the cycle for you. So you can then start to use this as a way to kind of validate um, what the cycle should look like. So it's kind of six one half dozen of the other. But this is the way I would start to see the toolpath realized. So between operations, here we didn't add a whole lot. Um, we were shutting the spindle off, gave it an op stop. We're then going to call out the next operation that's coming up, load our drill, do a tool change. We reactivated the work coordinate system. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, when you're doing a mid-program restart in our control, we can scan to that point and load it, but if I want to just start from this tool because I know it's a safe location, then it would be a good habit to reinitiate the work coordinate. But we're still, that first work coordinate is always happening, like I told you, just above the workpiece blank. And then end of program, we did the super command to then drive us to that safety location. We reactivated the tool offset with a D1. So that's important. If you're not going to do a tool change right after this command and you're leaving this tool in the spindle, then don't leave the tool offset canceled. So just reactivate whatever the, the physical decode I was using when I loaded the tool. And then we have an end of program. So the last one I'm going to show you guys, just to give you an example of how a um, surface program would look like. Now this is... Um, really more of like a high-speed roughing type of tool path. So here you're just going to get an example of what the final output would look like using our uh, Cycle A32. So all the other stuff is identical to what I just showed you. But now you see where Cycle A32 comes in. So generally speaking, I always tell guys I would position Cycle A32 just before you get into cut. Um, you don't want to have Cycle 32 on through tool changes or anything like that. Um, so get your tool change done, get your spindle fired up, all that good stuff. Get into like a safety position, fire up your Cycle 32, then get down and cut. And then maintain Cycle 32. We'll zip on down. Probably should have collapsed. It's quicker. So we're going to then maintain Cycle 32 until probably my, my end of operation. Then we'll cancel it, not necessarily knowing whether or not we're going to use it again. And even if we were going to use it again, we're probably going to reset it up. So here we reset up for the next strategy and continue on. And you see where we're letting this hold out. So we're holding out to six decimal places whenever needed. Um, not all, I don't always need them, but if I do, you're going to want to let it hold out to the six decimal places to alleviate any rounding error. So... We covered a lot of material. I went a little over time. I see a lot of you guys hung on. I appreciate that. I did want to give you guys a chance to ask questions on the content. So you have the Q&A panel as well as the chat window. So if you guys are still, uh, still hanging out for a few more minutes and you'd like to ask me a few questions on the content or any, any questions, by all means, please feel free to tap, type them into the chat or the Q&A panel. Um, so I'm going to start scrolling back through. I know there was quite a bit of um, chatting going on in our chat window, so I want to see if I uh, can find any 
All right, so Dan had a question. Uh, would you have to change the TOFR correct uh, to minus 0.5? Um, oh, he might have been thinking about diametric versus radius. So it is a radial value. Um, so if I have half in general, I'm going to plug in a TOFR command of the radius value. Because internally, we really always store it as a radius. Um, okay, great. So a lot of nice comments. I appreciate all the comments. Uh, I'm just looking through. Here, just want to make sure I don't miss any commands. All right, and do do. So, how accurate is the cycles between VNCK and Sinu Train? So, the dirty little secret is Sinu Train is running VNCK. So that's how we know. So it's really identical. So VNCK, virtual NCK. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Greg was asking about um, cycle time. So it's the same scenario. It should be it should be identical because we are really running VNCK inside of Sinu Train. Um, so the way it works is you just want to make sure your VNCK was built from an archive that's very closely built from your machine. Same thing with Sinu Train. If you want to get to that level of doing like cycle time analysis, which I do actually all the time, I'll pull an archive from the physical machine or have them sent to me and I'll run it through a utility that we have and it builds a set file inside of Cindy train so then when I run it not only does the system know uh, well, how to interpret can cycles and drilling cycles but it takes into account all of my tuning parameters that were commissioned on that machine so now I get a, a very accurate cycle time and usually in Cindy train as well as in VNCK if I do have a discrepancy it's typically in tool change time because that's usually the area that we're not getting a great time representation. But once I look at cut time, it's extremely accurate. I've done testing on like hour long part programs and Sydney train was within seconds to what I saw on the real machine. Uh, here's another question from Mohammed. Uh, this is basically a question related to mill turn. That's fine. With two turrets and two spindles, does outputting MPF and SPF file has anything to do with multi-channel programs? Uh, no, but what it does have to do is you're going to have a job file when you get to multi-spindle, and more importantly, multi-channel machines. Um, so both part programs, one in each um, channel, is going to be an MPF file, just like I showed you today. But to manage them, you would use a job file. So I did a webinar. I would go back and look in my library of webinars. Um, I did it originally around shop turn, but the fundamentals are all still the same. So it'll really give you a good understanding of dealing with multi-channel. Um, I will be doing that equivalent of that webinar in G-Code as well. So keep your eyes out for that. But, um, but yeah, you're going to just use MPF files, but each channel will have its own MPF, and then the job file really manages both of those for the channels. Um, how would one do probing? So that's a good question. So um, from the probing side, we have a full library of probing cycles available within the Siemens control. Um, if I jump over, I don't know if this machine is set up for it. It is not. Um, I can't turn it on, unfortunately, now. But if you have the probing cycles, if you expand it over, if I had the little arrow button, I would see the probing cycles available. They're, they're really the same cycles that I would see out here in JOG. Um, doo -doo. We have a library of different measuring cycles available for you. Well, you can program with those. Now, it is an option, so the control would have to have the probing cycles for in-process probing. You always get them in JOG, but if you want to use them in auto, it's an option. That's why I don't have it turned on in this machine right now. Um, and then you can write to those. Now, additionally, we do support the Renishaw cycles. Uh, Renishaw has uh, their Productivity Plus, um, their cycle package can be run on the Cinemera control, uh, but it would be have to be set up on that specific machine tool. So obviously by default out of the box, the Siemens isn't supporting the Renishaw cycles. We use our own, but you can do either one. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, we have version 4.7 Sinu Train. Is it possible to upgrade to 4.8? Also, we have the machine control license. So you can do an upgrade to 4.8. Now, 
Not sure if it would really be beneficial, but we do have a process where you can um, basically upgrade your current license into the next version's license. Um, also, depending on when you bought Sinew Train, um, we now now when you buy Sinew Train, you get maintenance. We used, we never did maintenance before, but the nice part about maintenance is, it is basically about the same price, but you get it for one year. Um, with automatically rolled into the sinew train price, but then you have the automatic ability to upgrade to the later version within that year. So um, depending, Greg, when you guys bought 4.7, you may have maintenance. If you do, you could probably get it, or you could look at upgrading to upgrading your physical license. That is a possibility. Um, doo -doo. Oh, so, um, Greg is asking, we saw a timestamp on your group name line. What is that time? Okay. So in our editor, all right, uh, let me go back to, where did we have that? Um, let me see. Something I simulated. Maybe I don't have turned on. So once you simulate, let's try running this one. See if it gets it, maybe because I changed programs probably. We have the ability of setting up um, cycle time estimation right inside of simulation mode. And this would work the same way at the control as it does here in the machine. And what happens is once it's been simulated, see how we get different times. So what this is telling me is that this group, this section of the group would have taken four minutes and seven seconds to run. This section of the group took 24 seconds, that took 31, and uh, I guess I don't have it turned on right now. There's a couple settings under edit and settings. You can turn on your save machining times and whatnot. So this is determining machine times by group, but then it would give me also a total machining time at the end. So that's what that is. Those are estimated cycle times for those given operations. Okay, that's a lot of great questions. I think and hope I got everybody. If I didn't, everybody should have my contact information. Let me bring it up here one more time. Oops, no, I wanted this one, sorry. There is my contact information by all means. Um, if you need anything, shoot me an email, give me a call. Um, if you want any of these examples, by all means, reach out to me and I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Thanks everybody for attending, I appreciate it. Have a good day.